you for coming, Tom. Um, I just have one quick announcement before Robert gets started. Please, if you have not created your token for a feature, it's going to right around the corner because after lunch it's going to kind of turn into the Wild West. Um, if you have a feature that doesn't fit and you want a different size after lunch, you can train in that feature for a feature of any other size. Um, the smalls and the mediums and the double X and triple X are kind of limited sizing, but you know, they have a ton of large and extra large so that's what you need to do. Um, we'll also allow people to buy extra t-shirts, which can be $10 cash only, with ATM right behind the Monster Girls by registration, and preferably exact change. Um, but besides that, I want to welcome Robert. It's the first time speaking at Shomi Town. I'm going to give it up for you. All right, good morning. Thanks for uh, showing up on time this morning. All right, so this is an outline of the brief I'm going to talk about. I know the concept of a budget range is, is somewhat um, scalable, depending on who you are, if you're a company or an individual. Um, but we'll talk about some more of the specifics in terms of hardware and money and things like that. But this is the uh, overall outline of what I'll hopefully be covering during this 50-minute brief. All right, so some disclaimers before I go anywhere, because I'm surprised no one else has disclaimers. Um, I'm going to mention tools and companies and things like that. Those are things that I've used. Um, you may have a better resource out there. Google may have come out with something crazy in the last five minutes, and Microsoft may have bought something, and now it's terrible. Uh, so I make no promises about anything I say to use in this brief. It worked for me when I used it. That's why I recommended it. It may not work for you. It, there may be a better thing out there. Um, the methodology I'm going to talk about in this brief is not ideal for testing. So if you're some kind of teacher or college or you want to evaluate um, people you're recruiting to hire at your company, it's not great because we cheat a little bit. Um, we, uh, we'll talk about some ways we cheat and things we ignore. And if you're trying to test someone, they can really exploit those cheats that we do and know exactly which traffic's malicious or which traffic um, is coming from which host. Because we do have to cheat in order to do this on a budget. Um, everything's going to scale with your resources. In this brief, I downsized it as much as possible. We have two hosts. We've got a VM and the base host. If you have extra RAM, and I mean like a gig of extra RAM, you know, lying around, you can add a whole new VM, or you can add other resources. But we're scaling this down as much as possible to, to reach as many people as possible. Um, as always, be careful with your internet downloads and resources. Um, I'm not responsible for anyone becoming a crypto miner. Uh, and I'm going to use the word student, operator, you, I don't know what other ones, interchangeably. They're all you, but... I'm used to instructing people, so I call people students and operators all the time. I'm sorry. All right, so introduction. Who am I? Why am I giving this talk? So my name's Rob Geiler. I'm a captain in the United States Air Force. Um, currently, I lead a small team of roughly 12 people to do generic cyber defense stuff, so pen testing, network health, uh, things like that. My previous job, because the Air Force likes to move people around a lot, is uh, I was a training lead for roughly 100-plus people at Scott Air Force Base. Um, one thing to caveat is this brief is in no way affiliated with the Air Force. That's just my occupation. It's not sponsored or none of this was put on by the Air Force. So I just want to say this is not the official view of the United States government. Um, I have a degree in computer science. Uh, got it from the United States Air Force Academy. I yeah. I collect a lot of certifications because uh, your tax dollars pay for it. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> If you have any questions about which one of these I think is actually useful, um, I'll let you know. Um, just ask me afterwards. And um, selfish pitch, I'm job hunting, so if anyone's hiring, um, business cards would be great. All right, so the motto of this brief is cheat. We're just going to cheat everything. We're not going to do anything for real unless we really have to. Um, we're going to use existing programs. Every time I talk to one of my students or someone I'm working with about how they're going to build their own range. For some reason, they think they got to pull Scapy out and they got to hand jam all the packets they're going to run across their network. And then they have to set up literal thousands of servers with a domain controller and a, a backup domain controller and NTP through the internet. And now we're going to cheat, but we're also going to use existing programs. So it, we're not going to write our own um, web browser. We're just going to use an existing web browser. I know that sounds common sense, but for some reason when people think about building these ranges, building traffic generation across their network, they think they have to stand that all up from the byte, from the packet, from the frame. Um, it's not necessary. 
rely on your operating system to do as much of the processing as possible. Uh, at one point in here, uh, we'll talk about picking a random interface and having it do something. I don't even error check that. I literally just have the operating system output the error to dev null and we proceed on with the, with the traffic generation. You want to cheat as much as possible because every time you have to do some kind of complex algorithm programming or complex packet generation, um, you're going to be wasting your time on something that's really not going to be too fruitful other than teaching you that very specific set of skills. Uh, we're going to use PCAPs. Uh, for some reason, people don't like PCAPs a lot. They like to have traffic actually moving across their network. And the thing I recommend for most of you is to simulate that as much as possible. So if you want to have a PCAP with malware in it, don't figure out how to get the malware working on your network or get the malware downloaded on your network. Have a packet that's in the same realism as that malware packet. So going from host to host, going from a file server to the computer, going from a malware C2 server to the computer, and have it have a password in it. Like the password is malware's bad. And give the student a password encrypted PCAP of the malware. And that way you don't have to waste time downloading the PCAP. You don't have to waste time trying to set up the network to properly move this every time. You don't have to worry about frame headers or time or encryption or anything like that. They already have a 100% known working, never going to change PCAP. And all you're giving them is a password that proves they could have downloaded the PCAP correctly. Now, if you're trying to teach more in depth or more intermediate uh, packet capture or packet analysis skills, sure, we can't cheat as much on those. But for the entry level student, it really doesn't matter where they get that PCAP from as long as they prove they could have done it legitimately with TCP dump Wireshark. Um, this goes big for other file types too. Um, the government, for some reason, when I do my training, loves to have me run Nessus myself and sit there for an hour uh, in a one-day course or a one-week course. That hour is really valuable time. It's a 40th of my time, just sitting there waiting for a scan to finish. Have them run the scan ahead of time, encrypt the contents, either set up an alias for the command that would start the command, or set up some kind of, hell, the, the teacher can come over and validate that you ran the right command and just give them the password. We don't want to waste students' time collecting or downloading or with bad throughput on information they, they don't need. We can instantaneous, excuse me, instantaneously give them the information they need uh, just by giving them the password and encrypted PCAP ahead of time. We're going to ignore uh, non-essentials. Uh, the big ones being layer 2 and DNS. Uh, as we scale down to 2 VMs or around 2 VMs, it gets really difficult to do layer 2 and DNS for a couple of reasons. Uh, layer 2 is rough because of ARP. If we have, if we cheat and add a bunch of uh, network infrastructure and don't cheat with layer 2, we're going to have a ton of ARP requests, which means without a switch, we're going to have all this RAM used up by ARP tables and trying to uh, go through the throughput of our NIC in order to figure out which MAC address is which and which one belongs to which one, and it becomes a nightmare. Uh, DNS is the same way because of how recursive or iterative DNS works, if you're, if you're not familiar, uh, Wikipedia it. But uh, it's really complicated to do on a very small network. Uh, we might as well just connect to the internet, which we'll talk about later. All right, target, target audience. Can't speak today. Um, students, teachers, thrift hobbyists, uh, people who don't have greater than 16 gig of RAM at home. Those of you with a gaming computer, I'm going to talk a little bit about what you can do. Uh, but this talk is really targeted at people who don't have a lot of resources, who have a spare laptop from high school or college that's just collecting dust. Or maybe they have their work laptop that they could throw something on, but there's not enough room on it to do anything with. Um, you're beginner to intermediate skill level. If you're advanced, anything I do here is probably going to be way beneath your competency level. Um, you have a little bit of Bash and Python scripting knowledge. It can be any scripting knowledge, PowerShell, Ruby, whatever. Um, if all else fails, you know how to Google things. Uh, I can't script at all. I can Google things really well, and that's the, the extent of what I talk about here. Uh, you're not going to cheat yourself. It's the same way with working out. If you set this range up, and know how to cheat, and instead of like finding the malware legitimately, you just go into your comp file that you built and go, oh, the malware's on this host. Um, what was the point of you doing all this in the first place? So you can't cheat your own range. Uh, if you have no idea where to start, if you've been sitting here going, wow, I really wish I knew all these skills, uh, but haven't started yet. Uh, and if you're defense or offense focused, we're not going to be too configuration heavy on this kind of range, 
Uh, we just don't have the resources to be standing up a lot of servers and making sure they work together. All right, so if you have the hardware, if you're one of those guys who has like a 32 gig gaming rig, or if you have like an Amazon cloud service or whatever, um, you're going to build a randomized VM network. This is what I'm going to recommend. I think it's the best one. Um, you're going to use tools like Kubernetes, uh, containers with Docker, or Terraform. Uh, those are all script or engine-based uh, virtual hosts. So what you can do with like Kubernetes, uh, which is a Google's product, is you can literally tell it, like, I want you to spin up three domain controllers, two NTP servers, a file server, and whatever. And Google, in the background, will handle spinning all that infrastructure up, setting its IP addresses, setting up all its back-end um, infrastructure for you on your computer. Uh, Terraform is a simul similar way. It uses like a, a basic-style scripting to say, uh, I want you to set up this host with this configuration, with these files, with these connections. And then if no one's used containers, dockers before, it's basically like uh, smaller VMs. I, it's hard to describe and this quickly. Uh, in a pinch, you can use VMware, the free version, the student version, with batch scripting, because uh, I use it on Windows. It is a nightmare. Uh, you will Google it, and it'll be like, here's a really easy batch command to... Um, like save snapshots and things like that. If you want to do it on a big scale, you have to play this really worrisome uh, timing attack against your computer. Because if you try and configure a IP address on a VM before it's fully stood up, um, it'll destroy your network from the inside. So it's kind of a waiting game. You have a lot of like wait 10,000s in your network and just waiting on things to boot properly. Um, I would always recommend if you have the hardware to do it and are going to use a lot of VMs, Put everything either via DHCP or via startup scripts. A lot of people try and set up this like client server model on their range where once a host boots up, it talks to a server that says like, hey, you're going to be this role. Um, that's really complicated. And then you have to set up a whole client server model. Just put in the VM's startup script, hey, generate a random number. If it's greater than 10, you have malware on it. Go run the malware.exe. If it's less than 5, you're a web server. And if it's 7, like you're NTP. And sure, you're going to get some weird networks when you do that. But this is a simplified version of building a test range, and it's going to give you some interesting experience trying to debug your network, figure out what resources out there. And then if you have the resources, um, you can use virtual networking devices. Really easy on any kind of VM infrastructure. Um, the ones I mostly used are VMware. And um, I can't remember. It'll come to me. Um, but it's really easy to just right-click a VM, say, add a NIC. And then you have another NIC, and you can add hundreds of NICs. And we'll talk about the useful not the excuse me usefulness of that later. Um, and then for scripted traffic generation, Scapy, Ostinato, T Rex, Warp 17. Go out and find PCAPs. I think I recommend a few here, and just either TCP replay them or um, scripted traffic generate them. And then you have a network that just has known bad traffic on it or known malware traffic, or known misconfigured NTP. There's hundreds of thousands of PCAPs out there that are going to give you what you want. All right, if you have the money, I think one of these guys is a sponsor, <laughs> um, buy a training range. Uh, it's not worth your time if you have the money. If you're a big company and you want to have your guys work on something, uh, it's really not worth the effort of having one of your devs get off his job to actually build one of these things because it's going to take longer and end up costing you more money. You more money. So CyberSense is great. Um, it's a product I've, I've had a lot of experience with. SimSpace is another one. That's uh, a company, I think, out of Maryland. And then SANS NetWars is really good at the intermediate level. Uh, it's going to have a couple of VMs put you through some challenges rather than a simulated network. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, use the cloud. Anything that you're going to be able to do on your home laptop or your company's range is probably going to be better with Amazon because they literally have the infrastructure to set up a range almost instantly. Um, this is if you don't have to worry about money because obviously things are going to get expensive as you stand up like a thousand hosts in the cloud. Uh, but if you're one of these big Fortune 500 companies who wants to run people through the gamuts or be able to say, hey, I have a range, uh, double it and we'll have two people work on it. Amazon can do that in like three minutes. So. If you have the money, um, it's good to go with um, DigitalOcean, Amazon, any of these uh, virtual hosting infrastructures. Um, give motivated people a place to play. So if you are motivated and you're going out and you're finding VMs and you're configuring them and you're giving yourself ridiculous challenges to do, uh, that's probably the best way to learn. Um, from what I've found, ranges are the best way to teach someone something. You build a range with a purpose. 
that purpose is I want to show them what bad domain controller traffic looks like, or I want to show them what malware uh, looks like. It's a range built for a purpose. Playgrounds, in my opinion, just, hey, here's a VMware infrastructure with 32 gig of RAM and, and a library of VMs. Go have some fun. Are great for you to learn yourself. If you're not trying to teach a specific concept, you're just trying to have fun and learn, um, those kind of playgrounds are great. Um, the, the best hacker I know, um, granted I work for the DOD, is literally a guy who gives himself these ridiculous challenges in his playground and then just goes to town like, I want a new version of Metasploit, but it can only use Netcat. Like, and he'll write out a whole version of Metasploit that just uses Netcat. And what that teaches him is, one, how Metasploit works, how Netcat works, how to do the frames and the TCP headers and everything, so you have to manually configure that in this instance. Um, I forget what else. Oh, he rewrote the Linux infrastructure to limit like how the shell commands run and rebuilt the kernel for a CTF so that if you were coming from a red team side, it would display a static page instead of a, a legitimate page. Um, the guy's nuts. But he did that because he gave himself these ridiculous circumstances behind his range. It wasn't stand up a domain controller. It was, I want to stand up a domain controller that only administers Linux computers. And that's where you're going to get all that knowledge and spend most of your time on uh, Google trying to figure out why some error messages that no one else has seen before. So, But for you guys who want to do a budget range, here's our top level plan. So we're going to use Bash uh, to automate and script a lot of what we want to do. We're going to use virtual networking interfaces on two OSs uh, to simulate hundreds of hosts. And then uh, we're going to simulate traffic with tools that bind to those interfaces. So a lot of the times when I see people who want to stand up their own range, they want to stand up like a thousand Windows VMs. And that's not even using things like micro Linux or micro Windows, which are out there, use limited resources and just give a basic footprint. They want to stand up legitimately like 7,000 Windows 7 computers. Because any one of those should have malware on it, and I need my operator to RDP into any one of, one of them at a given, at a moment's notice, and be able to do forensics on them. Uh, that's a ridiculous requirement. That's bigger than most networks. Uh, I'm not going to ask that anyone try and set something up like that unless you have the hardware for it. We're going to cheat and have one OS handle most of the operating system functions for all of our hosts, and we'll talk about how to do that. And then we're going to cheat, lie, and fake what we need to in order to pigeonhole this into our budget range concept. So if for some reason someone asks, why is all my web traffic coming from one MAC address or one IP address? We'll just say that's our proxy. Uh, if someone asks why multiple websites are on one IP or one Mac or coming from one route, uh, it's a cloud hosting service. That's how it works. We just have to kind of fake our way into making this work because uh, that's the way it works. We don't have a lot of resources. All right, so here are my specs. This is the computer up here that I've done this on. Um, this is my sister's high school laptop from 2010. It has three gigabytes of RAM. Two of those are split to the host. One of those is split to my VM. It has an AMD Sempron SI42. It has a processor that will have one core, uh, and it has 150 gigabytes of storage, which I estimate with large VMs, I could probably put four to eight VMs on. That's what I'm working with. That's what I've gotten this type of range to work on before. So if, if you have one of these laptops at home or something slightly scaled up, this is perfect for you. If you have the hardware, go figure out Kubernetes. All right, here's my operating system breakdown. You are free to modify this as much as you want. Most of this stuff will work with any Linux environment. It gets a little more complicated and resource intensive on Windows. So my base machine is going to be Kali. It's going to be our user net. That's where all our users live, all 1,000 of them. Uh, it's where all our requests are going to be made from. And it's where I, as the student, or I, as the operator, am going to be working out of. We're going to have one VM. It's going to be Kali. It's going to be metasploitable. It's going to be damn vulnerable Linux. Take your pick. As long as it's a Linux backend, uh, the methodology I talk about will work in here. If you want to do Windows because you really want to do like the eternal series attacks or you really want to do some kind of um, forensics, it is doable. It is not as easy to scale with the virtual networking infrastructure I'm going to talk about. You're, you're going to have to cheat a lot more. Uh, we're going to use VMware. Uh, you can use VirtualBox. I don't like VirtualBox. I don't know why I don't like VirtualBox. I just don't like VirtualBox. Um, this machine is going to be our web servers. It's going to be any other servers or services we want to run, FTP, DNS, if we actually get it up. 
Uh, and it's going to be our attack targets if we actually set those up. Part of the reason I mentioned Metasploitable and uh, DDL is because it already has pre-existing attack surfaces. Way easier to use those than for us to stand them up. 30 minutes, sorry. So virtual interfaces. This is our first big step. This is a thing that's been hiding in, under everyone's noses that many of you have probably never even heard of before. And it's going to allow us to create hundreds, if not thousands, of hosts on one machine uh, by cheating. And this is what a virtual interface is. It is an extension of an actual interface. So if we have something like uh, ETH0, right? And ETH0 is in the 10.10.0.1 NetMax 255.255.255.0 network. We can set up any number of virtual interfaces by doing if config ETH0 colon 1 as long as they are in the same NetMask. Because we don't have any kind of uh, layer 3, layer 2 protocol device in there and the OS for some reason, so it has to be in the same net mask. Uh, really convenient that since we're in our own little magical lab environment, we can just set the lab or set the net mask to 0000, and now we have all IP space at our beck and call. We can do whatever we want, um, and as long as you know you're not making any crazy routing or subnetting decisions in there, we have all the IP addresses at our disposal. Um, you can bind to that. Yep. Okay. So the benefits is we only have one MAC address. By doing this, everything gets the MAC address of ETH0 because that's the legitimate hardware MAC address of the card. So we get to ignore all the ARP requests, which would be a huge amount of throughput on our network and on our network card if we actually tried to do that. Um, it's really easy to script. I mean, I think everyone right now could figure out how to run this as multiple bash commands. And it looks and behaves like a regular interface in most cases. We'll talk about some uh, annoying things that don't work, but in most cases, this looks and feels exactly like a legitimate networking interface. So for basic scripting, um, I'm assuming everyone doesn't know how to do a for loop in Bash. I do one-liners, so everything's a little more complicated. Sorry if it's a jumbled mess up here. Uh, but it's for your variable in the range or variables that you want it to loop through. Do whatever, and then you're done. Um, really simple. Google foo. You'll figure out how to do while loops and whatever. Um, so it's really easy to say things like, for the variable A in these four numbers, and then for the variable B in these numbers, we're going to actually run ETH0, A, B, set up our, our uh, virtual interface. And now we have, what, 4 times 30 times 250, 30,000 IP addresses, 30,000 virtual uh, networking devices that are set up on our host. Now those do take up system resources. Um, I don't think I can quite get 30,000 to work on here, but that being said, if they're not all talking at once, uh, they really don't have a huge footprint. There's no back-end layer 2 that's talking that has to constantly be updated. So we don't have to worry about, um, if we're not running traffic across it, anything more than the RAM that is required to keep the knowledge that the interface exists. So it's really low footprint. Um, another thing we can do is we can use the random function. Really sorry, but for some reason Linux really makes it difficult to have a random function. If you want to cheat, you can use the shuff command with a list of the numbers 1 through 255, uh, if that makes you feel more comfortable. Um, but we can generate random numbers between y and x, which is going to be really useful if we want to build a network that even I, as the builder, don't know what it looks like. Because uh, I think if you're going to build your own range, you don't want to just instinctively know which machine has the malware on it. That would kind of ruin all the fun. So we're just going to uh, randomize it. So it's really easy, once again, to say for A in 1 to 240 in steps of 10. So that'll go 1 to 10, uh, or sorry, it'll go 1, 11, 21, 31, and so on. Give me a random IP address in that 10-digit range. So give me a random number between 1 and 10. Give me a random number between 11 and 20. Give me a random number between 21 and 30. And we'll build out a random range that way. Uh, you can, like I said, get a little more complicated. You can loop this and just generate random numbers. And if you get a collision, the operating system is going to handle that error for you. It's not going to like crash the system. So if you want to say, hey, loop 255 times and try and stand up a virtual networking uh, device on that random number. And if it fails, pipe it to dev null. And at the end of that, you could have anywhere from 255 uh, IP addresses or one IP address, depending on how lucky or unlucky you are downstairs in the casinos. 
Uh, and we're going to add a bunch of stuff with comp files later on to this. So we're going to show you, well, I'm going to show you, uh, how to potentially do some stuff like this with Apache. So you can set up your own websites on these devices automatically. Um, theoretically, you could do this with FTP, uh, with any other service that has a comp file that's easily manageable. So our first big decision is the Internet. It's what everyone always talks about whenever they say they set up a virtual range. It's what everyone like SimSpace and CyberSense talks about when they're all like, we have a realistic working internet. And that's what all the money comes in to do. Um, I'm not sure why it's the greatest selling point. Uh, building the internet is not hard. Um, it's really easy. The page is already there for you. So the data is, is already set up. I don't know what's so hard about it. First step, uh, we're going to use Apache. There are better web services out there. I'm old in that a LAMP stack is still the default for when I want to set up a networking or a, a web page. I don't know like what a mean stack is or what React.js is, you youngins. I'm 27, by the way. Um, but we're going to use Apache because it's on Kali Linux. That's basically the reason we're going to use it. Um, Apache supports two methods that are going to be really helpful in our quest to build the internet. The first one is it can bind pages to different interfaces, even virtual interfaces. And so if you try and reach a, a one MAC address on a different IP address, in this case one OS but on two different IPs, it'll serve two different web pages. The other thing it can do is if we get DNS working, based on the requested URL in the header, it will serve different web pages. Uh, you see that a lot with like cloud hosting. They're all on the same server, but because you requested google.com and not yahoo.com, the web server knows which one to serve you. It does both of those. So now we just need a tool to scrape web data, which is literally what all of your web browsers are. In this case, we're going to use uh, wget because it has some really cool flags for us. Um, I'm not going to get too in detail about these flags. I'm just going to tell you these are the flags you need to use at a bare minimum. Um, so first off, we're going to move to our Apache directory, and then we're going to literally run the wget command on a list of websites we have. In this case, um, big E uh, says convert everything to HTML that you can. That way if something's like a JavaScript or a PHP-based page, it'll try its best to convert it to HTML. I make no promises. It's going to do its best. <clears throat> M will mirror the page. Uh, K will convert links to local pages and P will grab all the page content. What that does between the three of those, it says, I want a local instance of this web page. If Google has an image link on its web page that says, hey, go out to Photo Bucket and make this image my background image on the page, it tells wget, I also want that Photo, bu photo Bucket image on my computer. I don't want to have to make a web request out to a different web resource to download an image to make the local instance of the page. I want everything on my machine. And the K converts those links locally so that the, the page knows where to go. NP keeps everything in the current directory. Really useful if we want to script this out later that we know where everything is. And then um, L2 or L1 is going to say how deep to scan. Um, do L1 your first time. You have no idea how many links are on a web page. Uh, it will get super complicated. So the like L2 will say, hey, I want to get the main web page. And then I want to get the second layer of that web pages. So for L2, it'll do every link on the home page. It will try and access the next page and pull those down too. So you kind of have a working web page. The problem with that is with sites like Reddit, um, Yahoo, sites that are like super link heavy, you're now talking about like 10,000 times what your initial footprint was. So the storage goes up, the length of the script, the errors that are possible, all those go up. Because you have to remember you're getting all the images for those too and, and doing a lot of processing on the page. So do L1 your first time. If you have a specific subset of links, like your company page that you want to go deeper on, go for it. But test it with L1 first. Uh, so how do we do dynamic content? Uh, I think we'll talk about it in a couple slides. So first off, Apache and virtual interfaces. Like I said, it's native on Kali. There are easier web services. If you want to use simple HTTP server, uh, that's fine. It doesn't work great with virtual interfaces. The first thing we're going to talk about, or well, I'm going to talk about, I don't know why I keep saying that. Um, there are certain programs out there that will not bind to virtual interfaces. They will bind to your default highest prioritized interface, and that's it. They will bind to ETH0. You can't tell it, like, I want you to, you to use ETH01 or ETH02 or even loopback. It'll say ETH0 is your default interface. That's the one I'm using. And Simple HTTP server uh, works that way. You can actually go into the sub-methods in Python and modify it. So instead of only looking for the top-rated Ethernet um, 
service, sorry, um, I, yeah, interface, it will look through all of them and you can pick one. Uh, I'm not expecting anyone at the easy to intermediate level of this to be able to go into a existing Python library and modify the methods at will. So I just say don't use simple HTTP server for multiple websites. Um, and then we just run the command in our Apache comp file, virtual host, your IP address, um, document root, so that's where we downloaded all the files to, the server name that you want it to resolve to, and then end virtual host, and that's it. Uh, we won't talk about name virtual host yet. So it's really easy to script. Um, you can actually put these at the bottom of your Apache comp file if you really want to. I like it to be all neat and organized and putting it right below the port that my web server by default binds on. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to head the apache.com file and I'm going to go all the way down to where I want to start scripting and I dump that into a new comp file. Then I do my script, I build all my web pages out at once and then I tail the file and I get the rest of the comp file. Um, I, I think that makes sense. If, if you have some basic scripting knowledge, it's, it's pretty easy to iterate through the list of websites you have and just build out these two variables at once. All we're doing here is picking a new IP address, which we already know because we set that with our for loop, and we're picking a new document root, which we know because that's a list of the websites that we used in order to use the wget command. So I think it's a, a really simple method. If you have any questions about it, you can see me afterwards. I'll show you how to do it on your uh, Linux image. Dynamic websites. All right, so now that we're done with static web pages, we're going to set up some dynamic web pages. So I just need you guys to learn PHP, JavaScript, set up a backend database. We're going to do some AJAX, add some React. Um, and we can do all that if you really want to learn those things. Uh, or we can just trust people to use the real internet. I'm not sure why most ranges don't do this. Um, the real internet is great. It has a lot of content on it. Um, so it's really great for generating traffic because it's, it's going to look exactly like it should and it has SQL queries and it has databases and it has ads that go out and fetch other DNS requests for things that you never intended it to. Um, but for some reason when we talk about these training ranges, we never want to use them. I know part of this is we don't want to trust our students. Uh, there are really easy ways to get around that. We can just block the student's IP, but not block our scripted content generation <laughs> IPs. So if we have an ETH0 that the student's on, and we have an ETH0, 1, ETH0, 2, ETH0, 3, ETH0, 4, that's our virtual clients, we just go into IP tables and we say, hey, ETH0 can't talk to the internet. Or we go into our routing table and say, ETH0 can never get to the internet. But everyone else that we're going to run our uh, web browsers on can. And that way, as long as the student isn't really malicious, um, it's really easy to generate legitimate web uh, traffic. The other thing we can do is if you want to take this to the next level, you could use something like a tap. You could use a virtual tap. You could use a uh, layer 3 device if you have room for an additional VM. And you could hardcore segment that operator, that student, or you off of the host to the internet pipe. That way there is no risk of you ever beaconing out to what FBI.gov and accidentally hacking them and then getting arrested forever. Um, yeah, and then we, we can just use things like the routing table, which exists to literally do this to route legitimate requests to the internet and our internal requests to our VMs. We have to do a little planning ahead of time to make sure our IP, ad our IP addresses link up. You know, we don't want to bind to 8.8.8.8 and then get confused why Google won't do our DNS. But because we're building the range ahead of time and because the people who built the internet set off um, 192.168, 10.0, 172.30, you know, those ranges that are literally meant for this, we can just use those to build our training range. It's going to look a little funny, but it'll just look like a NATed network internally. Um, by using the internet, we also get access to any other protocol that the internet gives us access to. NTP, DNS, uh, SSH, whoever's running an IRC server still. Um, we have access to all of that, so we don't need to build all those servers in our network. We can just talk to them. Um, I'm not responsible for any TOS violations, though. If you want to generate something that looks like a SQL injection, please find a website that's okay with you SQL injecting their stuff. Uh, most websites aren't. All right, so like I said at the start of this brief, I have a uh, OSCP cert during my OSCP test. Um, I was reverse engineering a, what is it, a WordPress RCE. I was going to work against the target. Um, I went through the code, 
I knew what everything did. I modified my exploit and I went to launch it and I realized that I'd missed a method call. And in that method call was an attempt at the second version of the exploit. And because the person who wrote the exploit wanted me to know what the, what the URL was supposed to be, he had used target.com and then the, the RCE as his uh, command. And so if anyone here works at target.com, I accidentally pen tested you guys in December. Uh, I'm sorry. I hope you're not running WordPress. Um, but uh, yeah, if anyone from Target is here, I probably owe you a beer. Um, but please, if you are having students on your network or if it is a red team network or you're, you're trying to test pen testing, really lock down what people are able to do. We, the process we call it in the DoD is defense in depth. Um, it's not enough to just have the route in there to stop you from beaconing out to the internet. Throw in an IP tables rule. Hell, at your router, which this will be going through, throw in another rule that says, hey, you can't get to any of these sites if you're coming from this Mac. Um, really quick to set up. It'll teach you something. And also, really good idea if you're ever going to be potentially doing anything malicious internally. Um, the number of times I've seen students either A, lock themselves out of SSH on a networking device, or B, accidentally pen test something they weren't supposed to, uh, is probably higher than people I've successfully taught. So it's probably going to happen to half of you. All right, but simulating web requests. So we just have two requirements. We need to simulate web requests, and we need it to work with virtual networking uh, devices. So we could use Scapy, craft HTTP packets, and then use unique hosts and spoof MAC address and do all of that crazy stuff. Uh, or we could use the existing web browser commands to just download a page. And Internet Explorer, Chrome, Firefox can all be run in like a hidden mode if you want, where it doesn't take up the GUI portion of your browser and just downloads HTML. It's a little more complicated. Uh, but in this case, we're going to use curl, because curl lets us do two cool things. It lets us set a user agent string, uh, and it lets us set a virtual interface. So we just do tack interface. We say each zero colon one, and now we have a virtual host that's going to beacon out. And we can also use tech A in order to set up user agent strings, which will be useful later. Granted, these will all have the same MAC address in the request. So using literally only the things that I've covered so far, um, basically only the commands that I've actually put in the slides, I have had my students in my training ranges build me a network map, uh, determine ports and protocols running on the network, build me a list of websites and IP addresses on the network. Um, I give them documentation and say, here's what my network should look like. And I ask them, does it look like this? And they go out and they run an Nmap scan. And they say, no, it doesn't, or yes, it does. Uh, determine which clients have out-of-date web browsers. This one always stumps everyone. They have no idea how to go, go about this problem without logging in and manually checking it. Um, that's where user agent strings come into play. You can tell what a device is, what language it's using, um, what browser it's using, what extensions on the browser it's using by most user agent strings. Um, Pretty good learning moment for a lot of the defensive guys. And then if you want to get more complicated, ask things like what language, what device, um, things like that are they using? Because it's in the web extensions. It'll be in the HTML response. If you have any SSL on your network, there will be some interesting uh, data to mine from those packets as well. So just using what we've talked about so far, it's really easy in five minutes to stand up a range like this. Because I'll type out the command and then up arrow, change a number, up arrow, change a number. And in five minutes, I have 20 hosts of IPs I know, and I can identify one as malicious or against um, our, our business practices and things like that. So putting it all together, uh, this is on the server side. want to start the server first because we're going to do some web requests. We're going to uh, move to our var www. We're going to set a count because I don't want to do nested for loops. I'm lazy. We're going to have a list of websites, and we're just going to make directories and pull down our websites while connected to the actual internet. So I'm going to connect to the internet. I'm going to wget all those uh, web servers, and I'm going to finish. Then I'm going to set my host to the uh, IP address I want it to be, probably disconnected from the internet now. I should have commented that in there. In there. And then we're going to li li uh, list through our list of websites. And we're going to increment our counter. We're going to set up a virtual networking uh, interface for it. We're going to set its IP to 172.16.0.count. You can make it random and have the operating system handle errors, but I didn't want to do the whole script of checking to see if an interface was already in use and then reiterating the random number. Um, I was just lazy. We're going to set our net mask to 0000. That way we can have as many IPs as we want. And then we're just going to echo this to the end of the comp file. And as long as it's in that comp file, it's going to work. So we now have 
an Apache service running on a specific interface that serves, a, serves up a specific website. Um, there's a little bit of string parsing you're going to have to do in here that I haven't added, so it's not 100% accurate. Um, but it's nothing that a couple of command line kung fu and VI isn't going to fix. And then we start our Apache server. Then on the client, we do this, what, five liner? I can do this in two lines um, from a terminal, but we're going to set our interface net mask. Uh, we can set our IP address too. We're going to do 4A from 10 uh, and 192. That'll be 10 and 192, not between them. We're going to do 1 to 250 in steps of 10, and we're going to run that command. So we're going to generate a bunch of random interfaces every 10 IPs, and then we're going to run a curl statement. And that curl statement is going to select a random user agent string from a list of user agent strings we've already built, and it's going to select uh, a random website to go to based on a list of IPs we have. Um, you have to build those files ahead of time. Thankfully, because you need those in order to build the web server, you've already built them. So now we have a bunch of web-generated traffic. And we can run this on a do-while-true if we really wanted to. <clears throat> but now we have a bunch of random hosts with random user agent strings talking to random websites. And if you want to get crazy, um, we can start talking about like setting up profiles where you can have a Billy method. And Billy only goes to ESPN.com or only works from 9 to 5. And you can get really complicated if you want to. So here's some things about virtual uh, networking uh, interfaces. So when I nmap my hosts, this is an nmap of the hosts, here's what I see, just, just a ping scan. All those hosts show up. Um, the MAC address is the same, which looks suspicious. We're just going to have to ignore that. But I nmap shows the legitimate host. So we know we can use nmap against it. If I nmap for ports, there's some weird things that happen. Anything that's running on the base OS will show up on all our virtual networking uh, devices. So if you're doing this on uh, a machine that has 20 ports open, every single interface will have those 20 ports on it. But if we do things like um, filter with IP tables based on IP address, or we do netcat on like eat 3 those will be unique to that interface. So in this case, uh, as you can see in the lowest one, I set up a netcat listener on 8083. So we can set up individual services so long as they bind to our virtual networking devices and they'll show up on port scans. So now, if you really want, you can set up static pages, you can set up um, netcat listeners on 22 that don't have FTP but are just there for the student to know that FTP is running there. Uh, you can kind of set up this, these posters that say, here's what the VM looks like from the outside. Uh, TCP dump, this may be a little hard to understand, but basically what I did is I did three pings. I pinged ETH0, I pinged ETH01, and I pinged ETH02. And then in a TCP dump request, I said I only want to see ETH0 and ETH01. I know it sounds a little confusing about why I do that, but the reason is, is because um, sometimes with certain protocols, if you send something to ETH01, it will also show up duplicate on ETH0. And for most protocols, as long as we set them up properly, it won't do that. Everything will function properly, and it will only go to the interface it's supposed to show up on. Um, that happens with some weird things where it ha the server is bound to multiple places at once, like simple HTTP server. Um, in your testing, if you come across that, you're probably just going to have to use a, a different protocol or something like that because it's not easy to work around. And then Wireshark. Uh, this is just a, a Wireshark request of two GET requests. I filtered everything else out. But as you can see, they have dis different destination IPs, but the same MAC. Those are two different hosts reaching out to two different web pages with GET requests. And it's just as easy as uh, setting user agents, uh, in this case it's curl, um, and ignoring the MAC address field, because we're not going to be able to cheat that. All right, simple things to add. So once you're done with this basic network that has 2,000 hosts on it and 30 web servers on your 3 gig mom's computer from the 90s, um, we want to add some things to make it more realistic. So I have four things in my bucket, random protocols, DNS, file forensics, and interpreter exploits. Random protocols. Um, after teaching for a year and running a team for about three, um, the thing I have noticed most about new people who aren't hobbyists is they think everything is evil, that's bad, and they don't understand networks anymore. Um, like I said, I consider myself old. Uh, because I'm 27, and back in the day, web servers, you know, had all their content on the front of the web server, and you had PHP and JavaScript and maybe Ajax, and that was about it that anyone used. And nowadays, you go to a website, and that website beacons out to a different DNS server to serve you ads, and there's all this other stuff in there. 
Um, and on your network, you had a network health monitor and monitor, and you have NTP, and you have all these other protocols that don't come in labs. If you're going to try and teach someone something and try and make this as realistic as possible, please throw in some garbage protocols to confuse you or your students. Um, too many people see a network health monitor and go, this has admin credentials in it or the word administrator in it. It must be malicious or must be uh, lateral movement or something like that. It's probably not. They've just never in a lab environment seen anything except DNS, HTTP, and SMB. Uh, we build our labs too simple, and we build overconfident students or overconfident operators who think it's it's way too easy to catch the bad guy. There's only two web requests a minute, and they just go to a static page. Now, throw throw a hook at them and try and resolve something with like ads that go to different places that could be on Akamai. So one ad is locally hosted, and one has to go out to China to download the ad, and and make it really complicated. And you'll see some people actually learn how web works nowadays. Um, DHCP, things like that, I really recommend adding. Screw up something on purpose. It'll be interesting. i got to go faster. Uh, DNS, I'm not going to talk too much about. It's super messy. Either use Etsy host and resolve it locally, then you won't see the traffic, or use a DNS tool, bind, or DNS chef are the two I recommend. File forensics, also recommended. Um, I use simple HTTP server for this one on the default interface. You could also use Apache and set up a monitor, but really easy to just go to a honeypot or a malware samples website, download a ton of malware, throw in an exe, a bat, a, JP, a JPEG, an HTML file, and then have your script randomly <coughs> download those files. So now you have malware traversing the network. Now you have an exe traversing the network. And if you really want to see a student try and figure out uh, tr beat their head into a desk, have them read the RFCs for a EXE file to try and figure out how to detect it in an HTTP request. Um, it's the MZ header is the easiest way, but you will have people losing their minds just trying to do basic file scraping in Wireshark. It took way too long on. Automating Kali, uh, there are a thousand ways to automate Kali. Um, there's Ruby scripts that integrate well, there are exploit managers. I think there's even been a talk here about someone who, who uh, automated Kali. In my opinion, the easiest way I've used is the MSF CLI module. It only lets you do one exploit at a time, uh, but it's really easy to throw into our script earlier and say, oh, by the way, at the end of this, just launch this exploit. If you have room for a Windows 7 VM, throw that service pack zero on there, and then it'll be vulnerable to everything. If not, use damn vulnerable Linux or Metasploitable, and now you're going to have at least war FTP, whatever. Really easy, once again, to build a list of pre-built MSF CLI commands. And when we start our network for the day, do a shuffle, uh, a shuff, to select a random line from that list and run it. So now we have a random exploit against a random target at any given point in time. Um, just using randomization and pre-built command line out there. Uh, if that's confusing, just ask me afterwards. Other resources. If you have never seen this mind map that's built by Aman... Hardikar, I can't say his name. Um, it is put on. It, it's put on a poster by Sans um, called "Practice Your Skills, Vulnerable Apps and Systems." It is the most extensive list of online resources I have ever seen for practicing your skills. A lot of these will integrate into your range, like you can add them. Some of these are websites that you can go to, and some are just like practical applications or blogs. It's an amazing resource. Um, I highly suggest you just look through it. I used about half of these. So an offensive range. So we're going. We're going to need to. Yeah. Real quick. Um, so for an offensive range, we're going to stand up like 10 to 20 VMs. Um, we're going to need to set up a whole bunch of vulnerable services. But not only vulnerable services, we need legitimate services so that the service isn't already vulnerable, always vulnerable when we see it to train you to actually do scanning and all that. And then we could use Wine so we don't have to use Windows machines. And then we could install multiple versions with non vulnerable and non-vulnerable versions and make sure they're compatible. Um, or I could just get really lazy and I'd tell you to go use hackthebox.eu. Uh, it is the best hacking resource out there. I have yet to see anything better than this um, on an OS level, actually targeting operating systems. There is a small challenge to gain access. You can cheat that challenge by Googling it. The answer is out there in Google. Thank you, people who ruin things for everyone else. Um, if you want to add this to your network, because uh, you basically download an open VPN and connect to it, um, you can throw this on your network. Just make sure you're not using any of the IPs that they use, because you'll have conflicts, and make sure you don't have duplicate routes, because you want to make sure things get routed properly. Uh, but real easy to solve the challenge and then have access to this resource. I think last call they were at like 84 VMs. Um, it is amazing. You will never build anything better than this unless you dedicate hundreds of hours to it. So 
I highly recommend it. <laughs> Some advanced options if you guys really want to get crazy. Um, add layer two, add MAC address changes. First off, you're probably going to need some kind of layer two handler, like a switch or a router or something that can handle it. And then you're probably going to need to use the mangle tables. If anyone in here knows how to use mangle tables, please see me afterwards. I'd love to learn how to use them. Because uh, they're complicated and they're really easy to break your network. If you screw up an IP address, the IP address or protocol is pretty uh, redundant. It'll tell you something got screwed up, it'll tell you no route to host, it'll try and figure its way around your network, and then it'll die. Uh, if you screw up MAC addressing um, on your network, it's going to be impossible to debug unless you know what you're looking at. So I highly don't recommend you mess with the mangle tables uh, unless you know what you're doing. Um, that being said, the easiest way to do layer 2 is to set up virtual NICs. Instead of virtual networking interfaces, actually build a virtual NIC. So in VMware, you can right-click um, in the networking tab and just say add an additional NIC. And you can add as many NICs as you want. And that's a fake hardware NIC. So it'll have its own MAC address. It'll have its own connections. You can bind to it with any tool that can bind to an actual NIC. Um, VPNs. So if you and a friend want to do this, you can VPN your networks together. You can VPN or open SSH or SSH with the layer 3 tunneling uh, to your company's network, to other training ranges. Really give yourself some depth and uh, different networks. Um, add devices in PFSense. So PFSense is great if you want to add a firewall, VPNs, NTP, DHCP, DNS. It is a lighter weight virtual image as long as you uh, don't add too many rules. It's not going to use too much processing. And it lets you do a lot of cool things with the traffic, like routing it different ways or altering some of the headers or blocking things. Um, if you have an old switch or router or hub or iPhone, um, you go to Goodwill and you see a modem that looks cheap, plug that into your network. Uh, you'll get some interesting traffic, you'll have some interesting options about how to use it, and hopefully you'll learn something. And then challenges. Uh, so if you want to take it to the next level, I highly recommend you do some ridiculous things like I talked about earlier. Um, try and add SSL to your network. Uh, there are plenty of free uh, cert generators out there now. Uh, switch over to name virtual hosting instead of virtual hosting by getting DNS to work. Um, do man-in-the-middle uh, attacks or man-in-the-middle traffic to alter the way a website would run or the DNS would run. Um, there's, there's infinite options as long as you have the Im imagination for it. And I'm almost out of time. So I would like to give special thanks uh, to the people listed here, uh, especially US Transcom J6 if anyone's here, uh, the guys at Coreland DB because they're amazing. Uh, anyone who has ever hosted a Capture the Flag event, Yes, thank you. I love you. I, I like to win a lot, and I don't like to host. So thank you for the people who do that. It is far more work than anyone realizes it is. Uh, and thank you to ShowMeCon and the people I work with for coming out today. Uh, here's my LinkedIn. Uh, sorry, it's so long. I like to brag about my certs. Um, I don't think we have time for questions. Uh, maybe one if anyone has one. Uh, but you can reach me here if you have any questions. Or I'll be out in the hallway all day if you want to set up a virtual networking interface and ask me how to use it, or you want to plan out your range, uh, I love doing that. So we can set up a plan on my legal pad, and I'll tell you how to script it to build it. But any last-minute questions? Great. Thank you very much.